How are we doing today? Good? I asked at 9 o'clock if anybody had gone out to the City Fest. Several dozen folks had done so. And then I said, did you see me on the, in like about 60 feet on the air with the BMX bike? Did you, that, did you see? It? Nobody saw me. Must have been the helmet I was wearing during, during that uh, successful BMX stunt. As I, when I was a youth pastor, let me get into the book of Job a little sideways today. When I was a youth pastor, one of the things I camped out on was identity. As adolescents and teenagers, I camped out on it's so important to know who you are and who you are in Christ. Because we will long and often cobble together our identity from lots of other places. And it's especially in trials and sufferings that this comes to bear where we start building a life apart from God. We begin to drift away from our deepest identity and what God longs for us to be and how God longs for us to live. <clears throat> and so today I have entitled the message Identity and Trials. How to live in the middle of the story. Job's in the middle of his story. Unresolved trials, unresolved suffering. But he responds in ways that I think is instructive for us as we look to what makes us tick, what gives us our deepest identity. Jenny came to Christ after college on a church-wide retreat. I've been raised in an agnostic home. She found her true identity in Christ and her whole life changed. At work, she was given a renewed sense of purpose and meaning to represent the Father at her place of work. With her friends, she became more relaxed and she no longer craved their acceptance because it paled in comparison to the acceptance she now found in God. Her new identity gave her a new story, a new way of living, a new way of thinking about her past and her future. After she met a Christian young man, they married, eventually talked about starting a family together. Yet after two years of trying to conceive, Jenny and her husband eventually decided they needed to adopt. Yet this too seemed to be God's plan. Because within four years, they both had a young adopted son and a young adopted daughter. Jenny was determined in life to be a kind of mom's mom. The kind of mom who gave everything to her newly adopted boy and girl. To give them the kind of Christian upbringing and home that she really had never experienced. Later, eventually, God surprised Jenny with a pregnancy of her own and everything seemed to be working according to plan. Until it wasn't. By the time their adopted son Jimmy was five or six years of age, he had garnered the unique ability to completely control the scene with full down, full blown meltdowns and fits of rage. By the time her children reached adolescence, Jimmy had spent more than a few nights in jail. And her two daughters had, had her two, two other children had lived years in the shadow of Jimmy's troubles. And they, they themselves were unprepared for young adulthood. As she watched all her children flounder in one way or another, Jenny struggled to put her disappointment with family and her disappointment with children into the larger story of redemption, forgiveness, and new life. Jenny began to dread, even hate, talking to other mothers whose children were seemingly well-adjusted and successful. Jenny felt empty, isolated, and hopeless. Jenny eventually began to shut herself off to friends, to church, to her husband, and even eventually to the Lord. Though it would be hard for anyone to go through what Jenny went through as a mother, her Christian counselor was asking himself and her, why had this parental disappointment resulted in her coming totally unglued in life? Why was she on the verge of losing herself as she often put it? The longer she talked to a Christian counselor, the longer the counselor became convinced 
that her downward slide had more to do with Jenny than it had to do with the kids. The problem is that Jenny had forgotten who Jenny was. It was not long before her identity in Christ slowly began to be replaced by a new identity. Jenny's children had become her new identity. Jenny's children gave her life meaning and purpose. Jenny's children really did give her life hope and joy. The problem was her kids were never sent by God to do any of that. And so as long as Jenny's kids gave her hope and joy, they could also take it all away. God was no longer at the center of who she was. And all it took was Jimmy at five or six years of age to mess it all up. She became paralyzed by what had happened to her children, not just because she loved them so much, but more importantly, because of what their struggle took away from her. In their own separate ways, the kids not only broke Jenny's heart, they also robbed her of her identity. In her struggle, in her trials, Jenny had forgotten who she was. There's a sense, don't you think, that the struggles of life are always intimately connected to questions of our identity. And far from our identities being settled as we may think they should be by the time we're 16, 17, 18 years of age, we continue to carry around questions of who am I all of our lives. In fact, it was one of my heroes died just last Sunday, Larry Crabb. And I remember being with him in November. He said something super encouraging to me. At 76 years of age, he said, I'm still trying to figure out how to follow Jesus. It was a man that was still searching for his true identity in Christ. And so you and I, we are often more apt to cobble together our identities from the gifts of God. Instead of saying to God's gifts, thank you, we often say to the gifts of God, please define me. Even the good things of God, instead of saying and taking these gifts of God, saying thank you, thank you, thank you, we look to them for our identity and source of life and meaning in all of our lives until the day we die. And so we often cobble together an identity from the gifts of God. Instead of receiving our identity from God, we try to achieve our identity. In fact, I would suggest this morning that there are four very common ways that you and I often cobble together our identity. First, we often say to ourselves, I am my success. Identity is wrapped up in my achievement in life. But you see, if my identity is found in my achievement, the person who loses their ability to achieve and the person who finds success are both in a very dangerous place. I should know, I spent many, many years, it's still a temptation to define my life by achievements. <clears throat> One will feel depressed and discouraged by not achieving what they thought they should, the other that has success in life will be eventually enslaved to that achievement and that success. We're asking achievements often to bear the weight of defining us. But achievements were never sent by God into our lives to do any of that. Second thing we ask and we think of ourselves. <clears throat> we say to ourselves, I am my relationships. Identity in and found in acceptance. And the Christian will say, well, I was made for relationship. I was made for community. I follow the, the triune God after all. <clears throat> Yet in our sin, we often look to others and other relationships to define us, to get us up in the morning. Many spouses turn their husband or wife into their own personal Messiah. Their identity rising or falling based on the temperature of their marriage. Yet relationships, whether children or spouses or friends, were never sent by God to bear the weight of defining us. 
Third, we could also say to ourselves, I am my righteousness. Identity is found in my performance. And even in the church, when confronted by a season of coldness or maybe distance from God, you begin to realize something maybe slowly about yourself. You thought you were serving God, but suddenly you realize you were just serving yourself. You begin to realize that you were reading the Bible or going to church to feel good about yourself. You enjoyed using your gifts. You enjoyed having your passions fulfilled. And church was a way that you expressed those gifts and passions. Yet those gifts and passions given by God was never meant to bear the weight of defining our lives. For sometimes we say, rather maybe indirectly, I am my possessions, identity in physical things, identity in my beauty, identity in my athletic prowess. Someone once said that the highest value in Western culture is not in possessing, but in the endless march of acquiring things. And what I know about you this morning is this, the house that you bought that thinking that would give you much happiness now has a bunch of cabinets that need to be replaced. The car that you thought would bring you so much joy, you every time you enter it, you always look at that stain or that ink spot that one day that you blew it. That, 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 that um, chip on your car that you just can't get out of your mind. The person who places their identity in an athletic body or a pretty face is always on a dangerous and slippery slope. Friends, creation was never meant to bear the weight of our identity. So often we receive even the good things of God, even the gifts of God, and instead of saying, thank you, God, for these gifts, we look to these gifts and we say, can you define me? Can you help me bring purpose and meaning into my life? The things in this world were never meant to bear the weight of our identity. And so when I read the book of Job, what I'm most surprised about is this. Job is silent about all the things that I would have complained about. And his central complaint draws most centrally upon his changed relationship with God. Though he loses his wealth, his health, his kids, his businesses, his central complaint and central focus in his suffering is his relationship with God with the Lord. His central identity was not in being a businessman. His central identity was not even in being a good father. His central identity was not in being a respected and esteemed member of his community. Job was all that, yet his central identity was being completely devoted to Yahweh. Job cries. Job complains. Job weeps. Job's... Job... 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 Job or Job, it's the same, really. Job prays. But Job is not like Jenny, who comes unglued because she had placed her identity in her children. Job was not like the businessman who gets downsized and becomes despondent because his identity and the idolatry of success is suddenly taken away. No, Job's sorrow and all of his sorrows is his changed relationship with God. You see, suffering is often compounded when we look away from God for our identity. We're in the, when we're in the midst of trial, when we're in the midst of testing and suffering, we often are tempted to look away from, the, from our deepest and truest identity. And our suffering becomes compounded when we do so. So look at Job chapter 12 and 13 with me this morning. Job, by this point in the cycle of the dialogues, has had quite enough of his three friends. They have all given a chance to speak. This is what Job says, opening chapter 12. No doubt you are the people, and wisdom will die with you. If anybody says that to you, you might want to get a better counseling game, right? He has some classic lines in the book of Job speaking to his friends. He says this, In chapter 19, how long will you torment me and crush me with your words? He says this in chapter 16, you are miserable comforters, all of you. 
Will your long-winded speeches never end? I don't, I don't advise saying this to your spouse. Here in 13, we just read in verses 4 and 5, you are worthless physicians, all of you. If only you would be altogether silent, for you that would be wisdom. Isn't that a great line? If only you would be altogether silent, for you that would be wisdom. I spent the week hoping and praying that my wife didn't use this, uh, memorize this verse and use it against me later on. <clears throat> like, oh, like you, oh, Lisa, you're, you're, you're now memorizing the book of Job? Which verse, tell me which verse, are you trying to, to, to memorize? And so as you read chapter 12, <clears throat> you see Job extolling the sovereignty of God over natural disasters, over leaders, over nations. And so very indirectly, Job is saying to his friends, of course I know that God is absolutely sovereign, yes, even over my suffering. Verse 13, to God belong wisdom and power. Verse 16, to Him belong strength and insight. Verse 15, he says this, if God holds back the waters, there is drought. If He lets them loose, they devastate the land. Too little water, famine. Too much water, floods. And God is sovereign over each one. Verse 22, Job says, God makes nations great and He destroys them. He enlarges nations and disperses them. And so over, over natural disasters, over leaders, over nations, God is sovereign. What you know, friends, I also know. I also know all these things. Why not also over my trials and my sufferings? Friends, I already know this. But here's where Job differs from his friends. And here's where Job leans in to his deepest identity as a child of God in two places. The first place is in Job chapter 13, verse 3. He says this, But I desire to speak to the Almighty and to argue my case with God. Job wants a personal encounter. We might even say, using 21st century church language, that Job wants a personal relationship with the Lord Almighty. It's as if Job has heard Jesus give the promise in Luke chapter 11, verse 9. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Don't you hear Job asking and seeking and knocking on God's door? Why? Because his identity is not found in the things of creation, but in the Lord. So I ask you as you come to church this morning, if someone could follow you for this last week, what would they have observed? What would, they have, what would you have told them by your actions and by your words? What is it that you are asking for? What is it that you are seeking? What would that person have said to you that they see you seeking and asking for just by observing your life? Is it acceptance and relationship? Is it success and achievements? Is it just busyness for busyness sake? Is it, if I could just get that one more thing, my life would just be so much better. What is it that you are seeking and asking God for? You see, Job is not asking for more kids. Job is not asking for his wealth to be restored. Job is not even asking for a return of his health. What you and I would do, we would, we would fall on the ground and say, God, just can't, you took all my kids? Please just, you can't give, give them back? Give back my health? Give back my wealth? I can't even pay my mortgage. What am I supposed to do? And so this is where Job differs from me and you. Job asks to speak to the Almighty. Job is asking to speak with God. And I get the feeling that it probably sounded rather rash and audacious to Job's friends. In fact, Eliphaz replies to Job after he finishes his speech in chapter 15 with these words, What are mortals that they, are, that they could be pure? Or those born of women that they could be righteous? In other words, who are you, Job, to want an audience with the Lord Almighty? But don't you get a sense that this is how we get our identity right? I want to speak to the Almighty. This is how we get our 
deepest identity, who God wants us to be, who God longs for us to be, this is how we get our identity right. We begin to say to ourselves, I am not my success. I am not my relationships. I am not my performance. I am not my possessions. My true identity is this. Can you preach this? Can you remind yourself of this? Not Not only when things are hard, but also when things are good in life. Can you remind yourself of this? I am a child of God with a spirit implanted desire to speak to my Father. I'm a child of God with a spirit implanted desire to speak to my Father. That is what is most true about Jason. That is what is most true about Sierra. That is what is most true about Gary and Heather. This is what is most true about all of us. I'm a child of God with a spirit implanted desire to speak to my Father. Father, for Job, it would have been wrong not to persist in seeking God. Job is like the persistent widow in Luke chapter 18 who bothers a judge day and night. Jesus says that the judge finally says to himself, he says, even though I don't fear God or even really care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice. And what's so curious is that this Stubborn seeking and the stubborn pleading, Jesus calls faith. Job wants to talk to God face to faith. Is this not faith? Is this not Job living in his deepest identity, his truest identity? The prophet Habakkuk begins his book, How long, O Lord? Must I call for help, but you do not listen? Don't you think Job could identify with that? When Israel was going through trials, Habakkuk, he says, I'm staging myself on the rampart. I'm staying up all night waiting for God. He waits to see what God and what answer God will give. And finally, we don't know how long Habakkuk waited Finally, the the Lord replies, and He says, the righteous will live by faith. So like Job, Habakkuk waited and waited and waited and sought the Lord. You see, in the midst of trials, in the midst of sufferings, we can begin to grip tighter and tighter and tighter onto all the gifts of creation. We can begin to say, oh, maybe I'll just control my spouse a little more. Maybe my kids will turn out maybe a little better. I'm going to be pressed into there. Maybe if I can just get this one last thing and buy this one last thing, my life will be complete. These identities taken from creation better shoulder the weight of my deepest longings. This is what we say sometimes rather indirectly in life. But it wasn't the way of Job. It wasn't the way of Habakkuk. And it wasn't the way of the persistent widow. You see, in trials and in sufferings, faith takes on a peculiar form. And that, if we're truly honest, many of us don't have the stomach to do what Job and the persistent widow and Habakkuk did. We don't want to stand on the rampart all day long waiting for God. I don't want to be the the person who bugs the judge day and night until he relents. I want to simply push the easy button in my life like Job's friends told him to do so. Faith in trials and sufferings takes on this peculiar form. Faith honestly expressed in lament combined with the stubborn desire to speak with God. And you say, my spouse is pretty stubborn. And you should say, well, you should use your stubbornness as a spiritual gift. Have you ever thought of that? What, what is faith? What is the shape of faith in trials? Faith honestly expressed in lament combined with the stubborn desire to speak with God. How do you get identity right? Can you remind yourself this week? My deepest identity is I am a child of God with a spirit implanted desire to speak with my Father. That is who I really and truly am. Am. Second place where Job leans into his truest identity is in Job chapter 13, verse 13. But first he says this to his friends. He ends his, uh, his comments to his friends with this in verse 12. 
Your maxims are proverbs of ashes. Your defenses are defenses of clay. And then he says this, verse 13. Let me have silence and I will speak. Let come on me what may. Why should I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand? Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. Do you get that Jesus, that Job is expressing his deepest identity? He's saying something like this. My deepest identity is I am a child of God who hopes in God alone, come what may. Though he slay me, yet I will hope in him. Here Job again wins the wager for God. Satan has said to God, you know, all you have to do is stretch out your hand, strike Job's flesh and bones, He's going to curse you to your face, Yahweh. No, Job says, even if it is God who is coming against me, even if I feel in my heart that I feel like God is my enemy, I will still hope in God. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Where does this come from? This only comes from Job's deepest identity. I am a child of God who hopes in God alone. Come what may. And so every time that you and I, we try to cobble together our identities from things of creation, we look to the world to define us, every time we do that, we always lose. It all ends in despair, in disappointment, in emptiness. All the gifts of God, our children, our spouse, our job, our possessions, they were never sent by God into our life to shoulder the weight of our identity. So this morning, simply learn from Job. Learn to preach to yourself. Remind you yourself of these two things. Get your identity right. What is most true about you? What is most true about me? I am a child of God with a spirit-implanted desire to speak with God, my Father. And second, I'm a child of God who hopes in God alone, come what may. These are the kind of identities that a child of God needs to hold fast to in the storms of life. And even when life is good, that's the kind of identity that begins to slowly seek Refuge in God alone. The kind of identity that keeps second things second allows me to build a life on first things. Let's pray. 